I'm like, I'm traversing, which is already sketchy. I'm down leading, which is even more sketchy. And my last cam is like 20 or 30 feet to my right. So if I do slip and fall, I'm gonna take this monster swing into whatever, who knows what. Welcome to the Sharp End Podcast YouTube channel. I'm Ashley, the creator and hostess of the show. This podcast aims at minimizing future outdoor accidents by way of storytelling. Real people sharing real stories. Um, everyone, I want to welcome Dwayne to the show. Dwayne, you can go ahead and introduce yourself to my listeners. Hi, I'm Dwayne, as she said. Um, yeah, I mean, I I guess I identify as a trad climber. Um, my friends jokingly call me Crack Daddy because I'm totally addicted to crack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I started climbing in the gym like six years ago, kept getting injured, so kind of took breaks here and there, but, um, I first started climbing outside about a year and a half ago and, um, always liked the gym because it was like a puzzle, you know, you could always see like with bouldering the puzzle to it, uh, outside. I didn't realize that I could get some of those moves that I really like to do, like pressing moves and stuff until I found off with climbing. Um, which I know everybody is cringing right now, but whatever. Um, so basically, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I really like cracking off with, um, and kind of my personality. The reason that we're even here talking about rope sewing is just because I can never find anyone that like uh, gets as obsessed as I do about stuff. Like once I get into something, I'm like full steam. So, so you just if, get my partners to climb with. Yeah. Yeah. Basically like my buddy just had a kid. My other buddy, he is like doing a million things for work. My sister just started climbing. So she's now able to lead belay. But you know, when, when I started this journey, she wasn't at that point yet. Wait, so, so how uh, uh, yeah, I'm 40. I just turned 40 in March. Um, so basically, yeah, I started climbing outside when I was 38 and a half. And where do you live? Uh, I live in Asheville, um, Asheville North Carolina. Asheville. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I love so, North Carolina. Yeah, it's it's a great place. Lots of biking, lots of hiking, lots of climbing, lots of kayaking, lots of everything outside. Uh, and the city's not too bad either, really. I mean, it's there's not a bunch of chain stores and restaurants, so it's pretty nice. My uh, boyfriend is a, he grew up in North Carolina, and he is a really, really big whitewater kayaker. So that's where he learned the ropes Sweet. of the river. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that freaks me out like you can fall off your bike and not drown that's pretty sweet oh, but you know? off with thing doesn't freak you out <laughs> no it's super it's super slammer the hand jams the fish jams yeah you never cool. feel like you're gonna fall off those well thanks um, for being here again and and you mentioned briefly that we're gonna be talking about rope soloing so yeah yeah what the heck is rope soloing so basically anything solo is by yourself so free soloing would be like nothing at all, just you and the rock. Rope soloing would be you by yourself with a rope um, and you're free climbing, which means you're not using any type of aid ladders or hammers with pitons or any type of stuff like that. So the, the climbing technique is all with, you know, hands and feet, no, no aiding about it. Um, so basically if I was to describe soloing i would start out with what basically everybody knows which is how to top rope okay so most people probably start in the gym so I'll, I'll just say like imagine you go to the gym and there are already top rope climbs set up right so you have your climber ties into one side of the rope it goes up to the anchor and then the rope comes down and then the belayer attaches to the other side of the rope pretty simple right so if you imagine as the climber starts to ascend the wall, the belayer starts taking the slack out of the system. So if the climber falls, they just basically, they sit on the rope pretty easy. So top rope soloing would be like, okay, same system. The climber is now standing on the ground and the belayer starts to climb the wall. And as the belayer starts to climb a wall, they take in their own slack because the belay device doesn't really 
know the difference if the climber is climbing or the belayer is climbing, right? It's all about how it makes friction with the rope. So if you have your climber on the ground, you know, the rope goes up to the anchor, comes back down to the belayer, the belayer starts climbing, taking the slack out of the system. That is essentially top rope soloing. If you take the climber out of the equation altogether and you have the rope connected to the anchor, it's like a fixed rope. And then you have the belayer to start climbing and taking in their slack. That's top rope soloing. So the biggest difference with lead rope soloing is like, go back to the first analogy where you have the climber. Now pretend the climber is a tree, right? There's, there's just you and a tree. The rope's tied to the tree. It goes up to the anchor, comes back down to your belay device. You're climbing. You're taking in your own slack. And once you get to the anchor, if you want to climb past the anchor, you have to start giving yourself slack through the belay device, right? Just the same way that you would belay a leader in that situation. Mm -hmm. So that's basically essentially what lead rope soloing is. Once you climb past the anchor, you're giving yourself slack. You, you know, clip a bolt, place a cam, whatever. And as you climb, you're just continuing to do that, belaying yourself. So in the analogy of the tree and the climber, to yeah. get the rope up to the anchor, is are most mm-hmm. of these climbs walk-arounds where you can climb up to the top of the crag and then feed the rope through the anchor and then pass it all the way down so you can anchor the tree at the base of the climb? So there's, there's two basic ideas. So yes, if you're going to top rope solo, you would go to a crag where you can get to the anchor, tie a fixed line, rappel that line, and then you would have your belay device or, you know, a micro traction or whatever type of device you want to use. You'd hook that to the rope. And as you ascend, the rope goes through that device. If you take a seat or fall, the belay device catches the rope and your top rope solo. In lead, it's a little different because your anchor is typically going to be below you. Like the one end of the rope is going to be below you, tied to a tree, tied to a rock, tied to a bolt, uh, just any number of different things that you can use for a, a bottom anchor. So if that clarifies anything, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, cool. You. Yeah, yeah, no worries. But the thing is, with any type of lead soloing, it's kind of it's kind of like a rabbit hole of options. Like some people use backpacks for the rope. Some people don't. Some people use different devices and all of these things are very nuanced and probably outside the scope of this story. But I just want to give you the basics of how it all works. So the other thing about lead soloing that kind of can be a pain is you have to ascend the pitch, fix your rope, rappel back down and untie the the anchor of the tree right right because if you're wanting to do multi-pitch then that's that's basically how you have to do it so that's kind of a pain but that's that's life you know you get double the workout yeah yeah double the pitches and you know later in the story you basically realize that i did not account for that but anyway we'll get to that bit some foreshadowing Um, i like it oh (laughs) yeah uh, stay tuned (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. After this commercial break, right? Um, so, uh, Why our sponsors, Rocky Talkies. Uh, yeah, oh, no. yeah, yeah, actually, <laughs> but they are amazing. No, it's funny though because I actually I bought some Rocky Talkies anyway, just because I went out and had a mini epic with my buddy JJ, where we got stuck on top of uh, Southside Looking Glass. I don't know if you've been out there. Oh, I haven't been but, out there, uh, but we saw it. We went on a hike when I was there visiting my partner's uh, parents. Um, mm-hmm. We 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 drove that road. I can't remember the road's called, but we, he pointed out looking glass rock, which was so yeah. cool. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And you can hike to the top too. It's a really nice hike. Um, but he and I got stuck in a thunderstorm and he repelled first and I couldn't see or hear him. He's jerking on the rope, trying to like make sure that it's going to go through our, our makeshift anchor. And I had already like attached myself to the rope so he couldn't pull on the rope and we couldn't talk to each other. So after that, I just got a pair of those and they're awesome. And you actually even with, code, didn't you? Oh, uh, that was before I knew about this podcast back in the early days, <laughs> but they gave me 10% off. They're, they're super cool. Nice. Like they're super cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, 
And then, oh yeah, I was going to say, uh, I'd even thought about like when I go solo, leave one at the bottom and then I would have the other one in case I need to holler for help. But, you know, that's a great haven't idea. Done that yet. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. But, um, yeah, back to the, back to the business. Um, yeah. The thing about rope soloing, like I was saying, there's a rabbit hole for everything, a million different devices, you know, rope management systems, etc. And the biggest piece of advice I can give you is like dial in your system on the ground because I, I have made some mistakes <laughs> in that regard because like trial and error, uh, when you're climbing is way more dangerous than other sports. You know, I, I came from a mountain biking background and it's like, you know, when you go down a trail that's too gnarly for you, you can get off your bike and walk down. But when you start climbing something that's too gnarly, like especially soloing, you can get yourself in a really bad situation pretty quickly. Um, and that's the other thing is like no YouTube video or guidebook is really a substitute for like getting a guide, which is what I ended up doing after my, first solo experience because I'd done all this research and I kind of like got my wires crossed where I took some information about top rope soloing and mixed it in with lead rope soloing. And one of those things was to use a static rope. So I was doing my first lead rope solo with a static rope. Yikes. If I would have fallen. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if you've ever climbed in North Carolina, but a lot of the time the protection is not always there, let's say. So the fall would have been pretty major. And, you know, I look back on that stuff and that's exactly why I reached out to you so I could like, you know, pass on some of this information because it's much less painful to learn from other people's mistakes, you know, than <laughs> yeah. you know, in climbing, you know, than your own. So, I've heard um, that a lot though. I've heard that advice a lot to, to hire a guide because yeah, you can read books, you can read manuals, you can watch YouTube videos, you can go out a couple times with some friends who may not be as skilled or experienced as a guide but just to go mm -hmm. just pay for a guide for one or two or three days and nail yep. the skills yep. down from a professional who can give you the yep. like you know all the things that you need to know i've heard that time yep. and time again from this from this show yeah absolutely like tomorrow i'm going out with a guide to learn how to aid solo so pretty sucked about that as well yeah cool yeah so um yeah after that first experience you know making making those super sketchy and lucky mistakes. Um, yeah, I ended up getting a guide and moved on because like, <clears throat> so, you know, that's the thing about some of these YouTube channels is like, they'll show you the right way to do it, but they won't necessarily show you all the factors that can go wrong. And some of them are like really easy stuff. Like, like we were talking about the tree anchor, for instance, like when you tie a tree anchor, just imagine when you go climbing where you stand versus where the closest tree is, you know, it could be like 20 feet away, which eats up 20 feet of your rope. And that's like stuff that I didn't even think about until I was already doing it. Right. Um, so another thing is like short roping yourself. You know, you really got to dial in your system to figure out how to pay out slack because well, long story short, as you climb, the rope gets heavier and these devices really aren't made to be doing this with them anyways. So the way that they operate isn't really as smooth as it would be if you're just belaying a leader. Um, because when you're belaying yourself, you have the whole rope uh, pulling down the device and stuff like that. Um, another thing is something called backfeeding, where it's kind of the opposite, where one side of the rope gets so heavy that it create slack it just like the as you climb too much rope will slide through the device and if you take a fall i mean with rope elongation plus the the slack in the system plus you know however long it takes for that device to catch i mean it could be a, a really long fall um and that's another thing is like what if the device doesn't lock up are you tying like safety knots behind you uh so you know, just like as a backup. And another thing is like when you're top rope soloing, there's some devices that use teeth. So if there's slack in the system and you fall, those teeth, you know, could desheath the rope, for instance. And, you know, that's really bad. Yeah. You know? um, another thing about rope solo is the, like when you're lead climbing, you're paying out slack to your climber and the rope is moving over the edges. You know, it's not staying in one spot. But when you have a static line, like when you're rope soloing, everything is static. 
it's almost like if you were to rappel over a sharp edge, you know, how the rope doesn't move. It's just Mm going to stay on that sharp edge. So there's a lot of stuff. And one thing that I never considered, um, I was rope soloing at a really moderate crag and didn't consider yeah, yeah, it's called Bear Wallow. Um, super fun, a slabby crag, really moderate climbing, and it's actually bolted, which is rare for uh, for North Carolina. Usually if you see a bolt in North Carolina, it, it makes you more scared than if you didn't see a bolt because it's like these guys that do the ground up first ascents are just gnarly. But um, yeah, Bear Wallow, the hiking trail is like five feet from where I had my anchor, and these three hikers came up and wanted to take some photos and ended up just like stepping on the rope. Their dog was on my rope as I'm climbing, like, you know, 50 feet up the rock. And I'm like watching these people like, are you serious right now? And I'm just like, man, it's just like so many different things. Um, so those are some of the issues with rope soloing and why I would not really suggest doing it as a hobby. I just do it cause it's, you know, it's essential. But, um, after, after doing a lot of practice, I felt like I was ready to finally do some multi-pitch. I was looking through guidebooks, finally found this place called South Cedar, which has a ton of moderate climbing. It's, uh, most everything is four pitches. The first two pitches are anywhere from five, one to five, three. And so, you know, low grade doesn't necessarily mean safer, especially when it's like a ground up state. Cause the, the ground up first ascent ethics here are like, first ascents are usually done by super good climbers. And if they don't feel like something needs protected, they're not going to protect it. And so somebody who's pushing their limit by climbing five, six, five, seven, five, eight is going to be totally different than the first ascent who five, eight is like a warm up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So just be cautious to anybody out there looking for like, Oh, this is a moderate climb. I want to do this as a first trad lead. Like doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Um, so I wanted to scout the area because I like to check all my bases when I'm doing this stuff, um, ever since that, that first experience. Uh, so I went out to South Cedar and like, what, I wanted to what see. What year-ish and what month-ish was this? So this is September of 22, according to my tick list here on uh, Mountain Project. September of 2022? Yeah. Okay. So last fall, last fall. Yeah. So just to set it up, like I started climbing outside and nine months later was when I started rope soloing. And then this was probably three months after that. That's a fast progression. (laughs) Like I said, I just like, I I can't some partners, people. Come on. Yeah. Right. (laughs) There can't be, it's surprising that you can't find someone to climb with. I mean, after this episode, if you don't come up with 10 (laughs) or more climbers from North Carolina, I am going to come out there and I'm going to recruit them myself. Yeah, do it. Do it. I'm all about that. That'd be great. Have a raffle, like auction, auction the layers off. Um, yeah, totally. Like, um, I, I mean, I, all the interviews you hear about people that solo and they talk about this experience that they have when they're soloing and stuff. It's like, I'm not there yet. I don't know that I'll ever be there with, with free soloing, but with rope solo, it's, it's very similar. I would imagine because it's like, you're out there, you're by yourself. You don't have to cater to anybody. You're doing your own thing. It is more dangerous. You have to you have to double check everything on your own. If something is not done right, it's on you to notice it. And that's another thing about this story that I'm going to tell you is there were quite a few things that I missed. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I enjoy soloing. I do. I enjoy climbing with people too, because typically you can climb harder grades with an actual Blair because they can, it's one less thing you have to worry about or it's like 15 less things you have to worry about. But, um, so back South Cedar, North Carolina, South side looking glass, um, or I'm sorry, South Cedar looking glass. Um, so I went out to this crag, I checked it out. Everything looked great. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just like, imagine like a giant rock slab that has had little water streams go down it for thousands of years. And so what it does is it makes these little canyons kind of, 
um, where the water like takes the path of least resistance, whatever. So what ends up, what it ends up looking like is kind of like, you know, when you go to the beach and you see this kid on an inner tube way out in the waves, not the ones that are crashing, but kind of like out and like, He'll ride the the tube up to the top of the wave and then go back down to the bottom of the wave and like disappears, right? So if you imagine rock that looks like that all the way across, that's what it's like. So it's just like these big rock waves. And it's beautiful, but it's also logistically kind of difficult when you have like 300 yards worth of slab and then one set of anchors somewhere like in that desolation. So, I mean, it's just... It's really interesting. It's a beautiful place. But um, the reason, one reason I picked it was because the first two pitches of the four pitches are like 5'1 to 5'3 climbing. And like you, you could almost like climb no hands, no problem. <clears throat> um, but I just wanted to, there again, like get my confidence up, see what multi pitch is all about. Like, iron out the kinks because I'd done like a lot of single pitch stuff and just wanted to kick it in to a higher gear. So, um, you know, I'm looking in the guidebook at which routes are which, and I'm figuring everything out. And so I decide on a route that's called the Colombian and, um, it's a, it's a five, six first two pitches. Like I said, five, one to five, three climbing, then you get to the third pitch where the business is. That's the five six pitch, and then the last pitch is kind of like a five four something like that. So I feel really confident. I'm looking right at it. It looks totally doable from the ground. So I'm checking the other things like cell phone reception. Like I actually did a a, a phone call with my now wife. So hopefully she forgives me for that one. Uh, <laughs> so I actually had a phone call with her. Um, I was looking at the actual approach time because of like in the guide, it says 50 minutes and it's hilarious to me because even like North Carolina, they even sandbagged the freaking approach. Cause it took me like an hour and 10 minutes. And that's with like a regular camelback on whatever. Um, so I was looking at the approach difficulty in case, you know, the worst happens, you know, you got to limp out of there or whatever. Uh, I was looking for water sources. I was looking for a top out trail. I was looking to make sure there are tree anchors, you know, all this stuff that I'm trying to check out ahead of time because rope soloing is dangerous, but on site rope soloing is like even more sketchy, right? Because it's one thing to on site something, but when you have this whole other system going on, it's just like so much more sketchy. But after looking at everything, I felt really confident. So I decided on that route. Like I said, one, one, five, six pitch, the rest were like five, four and below. <clears throat> so I get all my gear. I come back out the next week and I'm looking in the guidebook and it says start 20 feet right of this route called sons of Ralph and sons of Ralph is very obvious because it's this giant arch. And I'm like, okay, 20 feet right of the arch, right? So I walk 20 feet. I don't see whatever they're talking about in the guidebook. So I walk 40 feet. I don't see whatever they're talking about in the guidebook. So I end up, I walk 60 feet before I finally see the first, what I consider to be a water groove. Um, the thing is, is like guidebooks are up for interpretation, right? You know, they're written by someone uh, let's say it could be like 20 years prior, you know, and hasn't been back out there to make a new edition since or whatever, but it's all up for interpretation. And that's, that's another thing I would take with a grain of salt for the listeners. Like, you know, if you can go look at these places before you climb, actually make sure you know what you're doing. It's very smart. Um, so anyways, got all my gear. I'm like, okay, this is the water groove. This gotta be it. It's the first one I came to. So I, I anchor my tree which is like, like I mentioned before, quite a bit back from the crag, but I anchor my tree and I start climbing. <clears throat> so what I like to do, I, I like to have my rope in a backpack and I like to tie a knot halfway through the rope. So that way I know like, okay, this is the point where I'm not going to be able to make a rappel if I'm not at the anchors yet. So, <clears throat> um, so I tie, I get to the knot, like I'm, I'm climbing this route it's five, one to five, three climbing. There's like two cam placements on the first pitch. I mean, it's like barren, right? It's just like this huge slab. So I get to the, the middle marker on my rope. I'm like, okay, I'm looking around. Anchor should be here anytime. So I get three quarters the way on my rope. I'm looking around, no anchor still. 
right? So luckily, even when you rope solo, you should tie a uh, a knot in the end of your rope because what could happen is the weight of that rope could pull it through your device, right? Which is close to what happened. I went to pull the last piece of rope out of my backpack and the knot caught inside the backpack. So I knew that I was out of rope at that point. So I'm really confident because the climbing is not that big of a deal. Like it's Mm -hmm. super chill. It is getting hot um, because it's big open area, no shade, but it is getting hotter in the day. And at this point, you know, like hiking out, all the stuff that I had to do, I'd been out there for like two or three hours already. So uh, I'm like, okay, I'm looking around. What do I do? All right. I know there's a route next to me. So I'm looking to my left, which is where the next route was that sons of Ralph. And I'm just looking. And of course I have these like miniature binoculars. So I pull the, the binoculars out. I'm like looking around. And so finally I see the anchors that I think are sons of Ralph to my left, but they're, they're like behind me traversing over 40 feet to my left. So I don't know if you've ever had to down lead before. Mm-hmm. On, on a route so down leading i mean is basically what it sounds like if you lead a route and there's just no protection above you you have to climb back down while your belayer takes rope mm-hmm. but if you're rope soloing you are your own belayer as you're climbing down you're taking your own rope right well, that's a lot to manage while you're yes. like yes you know, exactly. On the route. <laughs> exactly so i'm like i'm traversing which is already sketchy i'm down leading which is even more sketchy and my last cam is like 20 or 30 feet to my right so if i do slip and fall i'm going to take this monster swing into whatever who knows what um so finally i get to the anchors i you know i I get out all my stuff set up i repel back down like i mentioned earlier have to like clean your first anchor off the tree climb back up get all my my two cams for the first pitch and then get back to the anchor. So now I'm like, okay, everything's sorted. You said that you played, you placed your last piece of gear before you started to traverse. So you, did you only bring up two cams? No, it's just like, that's how barren the, the first two pitches are. That's like, yeah, there's just like, so the way water grooves are, it's like, Allergy, so that's like all that canyon. you could place. You, you could only yeah, place yeah. two cams because there were no there mm-hmm. were no places to put protection along the way. But you still exactly. had more gear on your harness to place. Yes. You just couldn't place them anywhere. Correct. Gotcha. Yes, okay. correct. Yeah. Because when you're climbing a water groove, like imagine like a U shape, because that's how the water flows, right? And these U shapes might only be maybe five or six inches deep but they're in a U shape. So when you try to place a cam in this little tiny U shape, you know, two of the cam lobes are going to be like really tight and the top two are going to be loose, you know, so it's, it's not a great placement. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's pretty difficult to find good placements there. Um, so, you know, I, I set everything up, I get my system back ready to go again. Um, and so I'm like, okay, like, okay, I got, I got my mistake out of the way for the day, whatever. So no, nah, not really. But so I start climbing what I now know to be the correct route that I wanted to climb in the first place. Right. And before I left the anchor, I looked through my binoculars. I see the anchors that I'm climbing to and I'm going and there's like maybe one or two more pieces to protect me but there again five one to five three climbing not a big deal so i finally get to the to the second pitch anchors of the correct route and i sent you a photo of these anchors and it's like one of the bolts was completely rusted like i would not trust it for a fall and the other one was like mm, not great but you know just not great and both of the rings were like super rusty so i'm like okay I feel okay to repel on this, but I don't know if I want to take a fall on this, depending on what's coming up, etc. So uh, I'm into these anchors. I'm looking at the climb ahead. It looks pretty breezy. And I'm like, what do I want to do? Do I want to just call it a day, go home? Not really. Like I, I want to complete this. This is like a goal of mine. I want to feel like I succeeded. So <clears throat> what I do is I find the actual Sons of Ralph route, and I see those anchors, 
And I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can get tied to those anchors, traverse back to the route that I'm on, climb up, and then do it that way, you know, because maybe those anchors are better. Maybe they're fine, whatever. So that's what I do. I traverse over again to Sons of Ralph. I set up my belay on those anchors. I traverse right. Like, How were those like anchors? Were they, were they in better condition than the ones that you were on? I mean, the hangers were loose, but I mean, that doesn't really bother me. Um, the, the bolts were not rusted. That was, that was my biggest thing. Well, that's reassuring um, you at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a loose hanger is no big deal. Typically, I mean, typically, but, um, so, so I'm at Sons of Ralph. I'm looking at what's ahead. I've got, you know, like a 25 foot traverse. It looks like there's a little crack that I can put like maybe a, a gray, a small gray cam, like, for those that don't know, probably about the size of an index finger cam, you know. Um, so not super big, but enough. So I climb over to this crack, and it man, it sounds like a drum head. It's so hollow, you know. It's just like you, you could you could make some music on that thing. But uh, so I didn't even bother placing anything in there. Um, so now I'm like you know twenty to thirty feet out, like just no protection. I'm just direct to the anchor, 20, 30 feet to the right, traversing over to the next route. And the next piece of protection is, this like really primo crack. And I know that it's going to be great. So at this point it goes, like I mentioned before, from five, one, five, three climbing to five, six. So it's quite a bit steeper and something that I forgot to mention to you before. Um, I was wearing brand new climbing shoes. So your feet are killing you right really, now. And my, and my feet are screaming, like screaming. I, I, <laughs> I would say by the time I was at this point, it had already been like four hours in these shoes, right? Ugh. Brand new, like rip the tags off at the bottom of the crag, brand new. So another mistake, which seems Break obvious. Shoes but, in, know. folks. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I'm up there and it's like free. It feels like 80 freaking degrees. My feet are on fire. They're screaming. I'm traversing this like 30 foot run out to this crack. And I'm just like, what am I freaking doing here right now? So finally, uh, I get to the crack after much puckering and sink a cam clip to it. I feel better. I like, I sit on that cam for like freaking 10 minutes, just like, trying to decide if I actually want to keep going. And I look at the climbing ahead of me and the thing is, I remember in the guidebook, it says that the third pitch is a gear belay, right? So I'm looking up there to see if I can find a place for my gear. And so I finally see it and I'm like, okay, this looks pretty chill. I can tough through it. That looks great up there, but there's like no gear on the way, right? So my, my big idea is like, I'm going to put like three freaking cams in this crack just in case. Right. So I put three cams in there like a dummy. And then when I get to the gear belay crack, I don't have enough of the right size cams to make a gear belay. And the crack is, I mean, going, going off my memory, the crack seemed really hollow and really dirty. Like, on the inside was super sandy and I didn't have the confidence in what I was doing to rely on that gear belay. So my decision at that moment was put one, one number one cam, the red cam in there, clip it and move on. And when I look up, <clears throat> I see a, a bolt. And like I mentioned to you earlier, when you see a bolt in North Carolina, sometimes it, it makes you wonder like, okay, these guys, these gnarly old school guys like placed a bolt. Is this going to be just like something heinous up here? But then I'm like, okay, it's five, six, it's fine. So I climb up there, I clip the bolt and it is a crux move. I mean, especially like with this, this foot pain, with this solo system, with everything that's going on in my mind, like all this stuff, this crux seems like super mega whatever. And so I finally get to the top and the climbing eases back off to like five, four. Right. And super chill. I'm like feeling like triumphant. I defeated the, the, the five, six crux, you know, whatever. So, and I'm, I'm looking at the anchors and I'm like, 
man, those anchors like kind of look kind of far away. <laughs> so I started climbing up to the anchors and sure enough, like my knot hits my belay device. I'm completely out of rope and I'm probably 25 feet away from the anchors, right? Like seriously, like what am I supposed to do now? So the climbing back down to the bolt wasn't terrible, but that I, I did not feel confident in reversing that crux move. Um, so what I did is I, I just sat down for a minute and tried to think, tried to breathe a little bit. And something I also forgot to tell you was that I left my water at the bottom of the crag. So, so here you're it's just been dying of thirst and 80 degrees yeah. sun, North Carolina sun beating down on you. Your feet are yeah. hot, sweaty and burning. Yeah. yeah it's uh, crushing it's out. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so I yeah, hadn't had food for like six hours, hadn't had water for like six hours. And I'm just like feeling defeated at this point. So I decide, I, I look at my, my harness and see what I have on me, which is not much. I don't have any like extendable quick draws or anything like that anymore. I think I use everything. Or if I had them, I, did, I wasn't confident that I could set something up. Um, so I had a piece of cordelette. So I took the cordelette. I tied, while, while the rope was still attached to me, I tied a bite. Or a, I'm sorry. I tied an overhand on a bite, right, before I detached myself from the rope. I tied that cordelette to the overhand on a bite. And I tied that cordelette to me. And you want to talk about something super spooky, like untying yourself from your climbing rope when you're on the fourth pitch you know there's a top out trail but it is like it would be soloing for like at least 60 feet even though it's easy climbing you would still be soloing um so un untying from your climbing rope is something that is is super spooky um so anyways i have the cordelette tied to me now i i let go of the rope it's it's where it needs to be. I climb up to the anchors and I'm taking this cordelette and just trying so hard to pull it to the anchor so I can like clip it to the anchor and trust a six mil cordelette for a rappel, which uh, yeah, you decide for yourself if you would want to do that or not. I don't know, but it was the only option that I could come up with by myself. Um, yeah. Cause what would be the alternative? I mean, the alternative would be to solo, up to the trail on, yeah, on, when the yeah. climb tops out or the alternative i guess would be to just sit there baking in yeah. the sun and getting sunburned yeah. until someone decides to climb the same route that you're on or, and yeah yeah exactly and the other else climbing that wall all day at this point no and that's the thing about south cedar that's why i picked it because <laughs> i didn't want some random three hikers like stepping all over my rope again mm -hmm. but um yeah, the options were, were slim because the thing is, is like, let's say, let's say I totally unattach, I top out, no problem. I'm not hurt. I'm good to go. Then I got to walk all the way back down this like bushwhack trail in those climbing shoes down to the bottom and leave all my gear, right? I, I got to leave my rope, all my cams, my tagline, anything else that I had with me, which is like considerable amount of money to leave on the wall. So the other option is try and untie my cordelette to where it's one strand now instead of doubled up. I would untie my cordelette to where it's one strand and repel, like tie that to my climbing rope, repel off that. And I'm like, nah, nah, I, I don't want to do that. So, because I, I would be basically like, yeah, relying on one six mil cord, which is rated for what, like 4.5 kilonewtons or something. I, I, was I like, don't know yeah, exactly, don't but it's yeah. a but it's thin. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not what you want to be doing. So I I sat and reflected upon my decisions, and <laughs> so I remembered, thankfully, that I had cell service. So I called my buddy JJ. He's like, I mean, he he's like old school, developed a bunch of stuff down at the Red. Like he he knows his stuff, and luckily he answered. Um, I kind of talked through my situation with him and I just kind of made this joke like, yeah, man. Uh, I mean, I could do, I could do that. Cause he was telling me like to, to down climb basically. And I was like, yeah, I could do that. Or I could just call search and rescue. And he's like, I mean, you could do that, but as a climber, you are your first line of rescue, man. And I was like, ah, this is a total gut punch, but it's what I needed to hear. Right. Nice, so, JJ. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, old school guys are, you know, they know their stuff. So anyway, he's like super chill. Wasn't like freaking out, you know, just kind of talking me through stuff. He's like, well, just like, look around, man. Like what's around you. And so I see like a mirage, a shiny bolt <laughs> on the next route. Right. So I, it looks kind of far away, but I'm like, well, I see a bolt over there. Do you think it would be safe enough to go tie to that bolt, rappel down to my stuff and then, you know, send back up? He's like, well, he's like, well, man, you know, I've done it before. <laughs> like totally chill. And I'm like, well, man, I mean, you're still alive. So why not? Um, so as I'm traversing over and uh, when I, I'm like 50 feet out, uh, at this point, like, the, my last clip was to that that crux bolt, right? So I I'm basically right above the gear belay that I was supposed to make. So my last clip was like, you know, a third of the pitch up. So I got two thirds of two thirds worth of rope out. That's how big the run out is. So I'm walking over to this uh, this bolt. And is it easy and, walking? You like more? Is it like a shuffle? I mean, is it pretty easy yeah, to manage would, yourself on the rocks? It's kind of like a move, yeah, I'm vertical, right? It's kind of like a downward dog. That's about the position I was in, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it wasn't too bad, and like I, that's why I picked that route. Because I mean, can you imagine if like if like uh, if I'm a five ten climber? Can you imagine if I was doing this one like five nine? No, like, no, I, no, I would no. be scared out of my mind. So, so yeah, that's why I picked that route because I knew the top was chill. I knew there was one challenging pitch and so i traverse over you know it's it's super chill uh i find an eyebrow to place an offset in it's like an offset blue and gold which is like a 0.2 0.3 i think um so i i go over to the bolt put my locker in overhand on a bite so now i'm safe like i feel i feel confidently safe now so now i set up my Repel. I'm repelling as a traverse back to that cam that I placed. I passed the cam. Now I'm climbing down, um, down to that bolt. I pass the bolt. I pass my red cam. I go down to the crack where I I wasted like three pieces of gear for no reason. I get all those out. <laughs> so I'm like home free at this point, right? So I get down there, I get all my stuff. I'm like feeling good again. Like, all right, well, we got the problem solved. I'm not dead, you know, we're all good. So I, so then I have to go back up. I have to clean that bolt. So I I go up to the real anchor and then I go back to the bolt and undo all my stuff at the bolt. So now I'm ready to repel. So I pull out my tagline that I bought from that, the guy that I took that guiding course from and i was just like holy crap like i've never measured this against my rope to make sure that it's the same length have you ever used a tagline before yeah okay so so yeah so i'm sitting up there like i'm a total idiot i've never measured this against my rope i just totally took his word for it that it was long enough so i've also never repelled on a knot like a carabiner block or a knot or anything like that at this point, I start getting nervous again, right? So I, I'm like, screw it, I, I need to get it done. Like I'm, I've been up here now for literally like seven hours, right? No food, no water, seven hours. And so I pass my, I pass my rope through. I tie a double overhand. I don't know if you're familiar with that knot, but I tie a double overhand just to make it a little bit bigger, so it won't pass through the the wrap rings. And I'm like. I'm testing it like with my personal anchor system still hooked in. I'm like leaning back on this thing. I'm like watching to see if it like gets tighter, if it like even looks like it's going to pass through there. Rolls over on and itself. Yeah. 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 Just whatever, man. So, so I'm like finally like, okay, well, here we go. So there again, five, four slab is great if you want to chill climb, but if you want to throw a rope, it freaking sucks. Cause you like, it gets stuck on the slab. It's like, it's so positive that your rope is just laying like 10 feet from you. Cause that's as far as you can throw it. So I didn't know what Alpine coils were at that point. So I'm like, I have these two rats nests that I'm dealing with 
the tagline rat's nest and the climbing rope rat's nest that I'm repelling. And I'm using a new device, which is a gigajoule, which is like kind of confusing if you've never used it before. So it's like all these little things that just add up to just make everything just suck. So anyway, I, I, <laughs> I finally get down to the second pitch anchor, you know, I'm feeling okay. And then I start pulling on that tagline. And as you've said, you've used the tagline before. I don't know if you, if it was on a slab or not, but on a five, four slab, every inch of my climbing rope is touching the ground, right? On an overhang, not really that big a deal. Like the only friction you have is through the anchors. But when you're on a five, four slab, the entire rope is creating friction. So you have this little tiny seven mil cord that's wrapped around your hand, just like it sucks. It just, it sucks. It's painful. It's stretchy. Like it sucks. And I was already exhausted. So I finally get the rope down, you know, like by the grace, you know, whatever. So it comes down. I set it all up again. I get all my stuff packed up and I'm like, dude, I cannot freaking handle these shoes anymore. So I take off my shoes thinking it'd be better. And there's like freaking like briars and rocks and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I'm ready to never climb again at this point. You know what I mean? So <laughs> finally, I finally like start rappelling uh, off the second pitch anchors, like so super tired. And I look over and I finally see like some other climbers like way down the rock. And I'm just like, man, they look like they're having fun. That must be nice. <laughs> I'm just like so jealous and pissed off. So I finally make it to the ground and it's like, with rope stretch, barely make it to the ground. And now I'm just like exhausted. I, I drink my entire container of water in like one sip. Uh, I'm like eating all my food, like just trying to figure out why I am doing any of this. And finally, um, I go to pull the the rope with the tagline again. And it's just like, it won't budge. It just it's will stuck. not be. And so it just everything I had. So what I ended up having to do was like climb part way up the slab, just wrap that thing around me and just like jump down. And it finally got unstuck. And at this point I'd been on the wall for like nine hours. I want to say, because when I got to the parking lot, it was like eight in the morning. It's an hour hike. When I got back to my car, it was, I think it was eight o'clock at night. So the whole, the whole ordeal start to finish was like 12 hours. And I think about eight hours without food and water, nine hours on the wall. And, and that day it was like in the eighties, probably I was like super, I was, I was my skin was just like, lost yeah, totally, totally. So yeah, that's my mini epic there. So to all the people, to all the people. Okay. So, so uh, okay. So other than you, uh, making sure you tell everybody to break in your shoes before <laughs> you go on an epic like that. No. Um, what were the lessons learned? What do you want to, what do you want? So yes, it was an epic. Yes. You, you taught us a little bit about um, rope soloing, but what do you want the listeners to leave with? Like what, what lessons did you learn? Man, I don't even know. Uh, I would say that being able to turn around when you're yeah, out of your twice. depth. You said that yeah. there are two times where you're like, oh man, should I just turn around? And, you know, it's yeah. one thing to like, we, us outdoor folks, we like to challenge ourselves, right? We like to push ourselves and find our edge. That's why we do the things that we do. But yeah. at what point do you continue to push yourself? And what point do you just yeah. say, I'm going to come back tomorrow? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the rock will be there. Huge. The yeah. rock's going to be there. That's the a good one. That's huge. So I, I would say actually the biggest lesson, the absolute biggest lesson I can give is that like what I said earlier, like a guidebook, a YouTube video, none of that stuff will teach you all the variables that you will face outside. Hire a guide. Yeah. Just for a Hire day. a guide. Have have a day. It is a hundred percent worth the money. They should charge more. I mean, honestly, it's like if you, if you go out with a guide and then you practice those skills the proper way, it is so much better than like the knot because i mean i'll put it to you this way i've tied i don't even know how many overhand knots i've tied and one time i was trying a new system on the rock which is stupid 
And I tied a slip knot instead of an overhand. And it's like, it's so easy to do that yeah. stuff. It is so yeah. easy to do that stuff. And it's just like, you have to practice these skills. You have got to practice them before you're on the rock. And you have got to realize that you're not a master. Like you can always learn new stuff. And the other thing is like, just because you read something, applying it practically is totally different. Like I went out with a guide and he was teaching us rescue stuff and how to do a Munner mule overhand. And it was like the way he set up the anchor was just awkward enough. It was so hard to do. And I don't think he did that on purpose, but it really showed me that it's like you can practice a Munner mule overhand all day long in your bedroom. And it's like, it's great. Yeah. You know how to do it. But when there's like your your carabiners like weird against the rock because whoever put the anchors up didn't know what they're doing or whatever i mean there's i know what you mean because the bowling is my favorite knot <laughs> and for some reason if the rope isn't just so i can't mm -hmm. tie a bowling i have to like turn yeah. around and have the rope be the same way every time because if it's yeah. backwards then my bowling won't be correct so yeah, yeah. practicing that you know, eyes closed, blindfolded, backwards, lights exactly. off, whatever. Just practice, practice, yeah. practice. One exactly. thing that you did mention too, which I th I think is a good learning or takeaway, is um, me measuring your measuring your ropes because you didn't no. know if your tagline that you bought from the guide was the same length as your actual rope. That that's a huge Absolutely. one. And then tying knots at the end of the rope. You you said you always tie a knot in the middle of your midline of your mm -hmm. rope. Yep. Those are also yep. good lessons. I mean, I would love to inspire people to go solo, but I would really hate to think that they went right after listening to this without doing any other type of research or practical experimenting or anything. It's like, that's not what I'm after, you know, like it's, it's a lot of fun if you do it right, but it's, even if you do it right, it's sketchy because every decision that you make limits your options later, right? Even if it's the right decision even if it's the right decision to turn around, you're still limiting your options in some other way. Right. I mean, it's like, you just never know. And that's the thing is like, you don't want to have to be thinking about how to tie your bowl in at night when you don't have a headlamp, when you're 15 pitches up, you want to have that on lock. You want to, you want it to be as easy as using a hammer. You know what I mean? Like you need that tool to be perfect. And that's, you're, you're exactly right about that. So Hopefully somebody learned something about this. And also one, one more thing that I learned too, is just to carry, you don't have to carry all your water and all your food up with you, but right. just having something like a bit, you know, I always have, I have my, I've got my baby Nalgene, which I take everywhere with me, you know, so my baby Nalgene clipped on um, and then, you know, a bar or something just my, mm -hmm. in my pocket or um, and then the rest of it can just be at the base of the climb, but just so you, yeah. you have enough to sustain you and to keep your brain functioning, um, yeah. when you're up on the wall for nine yeah. hours, like you were. Yeah. 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 Cause the, the, the system that I use now is a little bit different. I have a bigger backpack and that way I can carry more stuff without having to like decide what I want to take. It just like, it's big enough. And that's really important to have the right tools with you and stuff like that. And oh my God, do not wear new shoes on multi pictures. Terrible. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank so. you very much for sharing your story with us, Dwayne. And um, yeah. thanks for uh, the vulnerability. And I hope that uh, people can learn from your incident. Well, I, I hope that you keep making these podcasts because I've definitely learned from them. So hopefully a lot more people do.